That brings us to our first group of animals, the mammals. They are differentiated by, from others by muscular diaphragm, facial muscles, hair or fur, mammary glands, different types of teeth known as heterodonty, sweat, and sebaceous glands. Now sebaceous glands are kind of like sweat glands, but they're associated with hair follicles and they uh, excrete oil onto them. The first mammal we have on our list is deer. This slide is for both whitetail and mule deer. Their origin is native, their feeding habit is herbivore, and their relationship with humans is wild. If you look in the top right, you'll see a distribution map in green that is for whitetail, and to the left of that is for mule deer. Uh, you could tell it's a mule deer from a whitetail because it'll have forked antlers like the one in the picture. If it's a whitetail, they'll be branched. Uh, it's arguably one of the most important game species in the lower 48. The next mammal we're coming up on is pronghorn. Origin is native, feeding habit is herbivore. Relationship with humans is wild. Uh, you can see the distribution map in the top right, but it's predominantly a western species. It's more closely related to a giraffe than an antelope, contrary to its common name. The antlers are retained year-round, unlike most ungulates. They evolved alongside a now extinct North American cheetah, and they now have no natural predators. But that is why they run so fast. The next mammal we have is the bighorn sheep. Its origin is native, the feeding habit is herbivore, and the relationship to humans is wild. You can see the distribution map. It's also a western species, much like the pronghorn antelope, although they are going to be more in the mountains um, and pronghorn are more in the plains. Uh, some interesting notes are that uh, they have um, a large conflict due to transmission of disease with domestic livestock. That's a big issue these days. Um, it's a game animal in Idaho that you can only take once in your life, and their horns can weigh as much as 30 pounds. The next mammal we're going to cover is the bison. Its origin is native. Its feeding habit is herbivore, and relationship with humans is wild. In the top right, you'll see a distribution map. Uh, this is their historic range. Uh, now they are pretty much relegated to a few wildlife refuges around the United States, and some private holdings also. And although it's an entirely separate species and genus from uh, domestic cattle, they have been known to hybridize with them. They were hunted to the brink of almost extinction uh, shortly after the railroads made their way west. The next mammal we'll cover is the beaver. Its origin is native, its feeding habit is herbivore, and relationship with humans is wild. On the top right you'll see that they are pervasive pretty much across the entire U.S. Um, they were an extremely important source of fur during the early years of our country. It's one of the largest rodents on Earth, uh, getting up to 50 pounds in some of its northern ranges, and it's an important part of many ecosystems in North America today. The next mammal we'll cover is the black bear. Its origin is native, its feeding habit is omnivore, and relationship with humans is wild. You can see in the distribution it's spotty, not so many of them in the Midwest, but they're on the East Coast and the West Coast and a lot in the mountains. They can live up to 25 years in the wild. They're mostly timid, but have been, been known to attack humans. Contrary to their name, they can range in color from light brown to black and everything in between. The next mammal we'll cover is the red fox. Its origin is native, its feeding habit is carnivore, and relationship with humans is wild. It's actually a mesocarnivore, just like skunks and martens, so the majority of their diet is meat. However, approximately 30 to 40 percent, depending on time of year and range, they're going to be consuming uh, fruits and seeds, vegetables, whatever they can get their hands on. They're pretty opportunistic. They do play an important role along with coyote and other similar sized carnivores at keeping rodent populations under control. And still a game species in Idaho, but not hunted or trapped like they were a century ago. Next up are wolves. Their origin is native, feeding habit carnivore. Relationship with humans is wild. 
Uh, they're extirpated from the lower 48 around the 1960s. There were reintroduction methods in the mid-1990s. And if you look in the upper right, you can see their historic range and their current range. They were reintroduced in the Idaho and Yellowstone areas, and they were able to come back into their territories in the northern Midwest in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Upper Michigan um, on their own. They are now once again a game species in a few states, including Idaho, and their packs look like they're spreading in directions to make up their historic range. Next up is cattle. Their origin is introduced, feeding habit, herbivore, relationship with humans, domestic. There are two subspecies that make up cattle in the U.S. They're Bos taurus taurus and Bos taurus indicus, the latter being more tolerant of heat. Cattle were first brought here in 1521 by the Spanish. Longhorns didn't get here until Christopher Columbus came over. He brought them to Puerto Rico. They made their way to Mexico and up through Texas, which they're now associated with. Uh, the distribution map in the top right uh, has one dot equaling 10,000 cattle. It's pretty interesting to see how they're grouped in certain areas. The Midwest, you can see in southern Idaho, and uh, central California. It's pretty interesting to look at. Next up, we have sheep. Origin introduced, feeding habit herbivore. Relationship with humans is domestic. They were domesticated around 10,000 years ago in Asia. They are known to be one of the oldest, if not the oldest, uh, domesticated animal. They have a split lip that allows them to select food more easily than some other herbivores, and they have a field of vision around 300 degrees and can see behind themselves without turning their heads very much at all. The distribution map is somewhat similar to the cattle on the previous page, and you can see one dot is equaling 1,000 sheep, though. Next up is the horse, origin introduced, feeding habit herbivore, relationship with humans, feral, wild, Depends on who you ask and depends on what definition you use, but for this course, they're definitely a feral animal. I just wanted to put wild on there so I can talk about how uh, in legislation and some people in the public are going to refer to them as wild, but they definitely are, are a feral animal. They were brought here by the Spanish in the 16th century. Wild populations have existed to some extent ever since. Their presence on the landscape has resulted in the cost of many millions to taxpayers over the years. The distribution map shows uh, where they're predominantly located, which looks like uh, southern Oregon, all of Nevada, some heavy populations in Utah and Wyoming, and a lot in Arizona also, with a few spots in California and Idaho. The next group of animals we're going to talk about are birds. Some things that make them unique are fused and hollow bones to facilitate flight. Another is they only lay eggs for the same reason as above. Uh, carrying around an infant in your stomach probably wouldn't make for very quick or agile flight. They have modified hairs known as feathers. Uh, very few are herbivores. Uh, they also have uh, part of their eye that other animals lack, and it's called pectin, and it um, allows the cells to regenerate uh, faster and gives them more clear and sharper vision. They also have beaks and no teeth, but you can get a good idea of what kind of food they consume by looking at the shape of their beak, and that'll tell you in similar ways when you look at a, a mammal's uh, teeth what kind of food they consume. Our first bird up is the greater sage grouse. Its origin is native. Feeding habit is omnivore, and relationship with humans is wild. They are a sagebrush obligate species, which means if sagebrush went away, so would the sage grouse. You can see their distribution up there in the upper right. It also uh, overlaps perfectly with, with sagebrush distribution, which shouldn't be a surprise at all. They have been on the brink of listing uh, with the endangered species list for a while, and it's been back and forth for many, many years. Um, in their early part of their years, they're reliant on insects, uh, and then as they get older, they start switching to, to more um, sagebrush consumption. Next up is the burrowing owl. Its origin is native, feeding habit is carnivore, and relationship with humans is wild. Unlike most owls, they're actually awake during the day. When they feel threatened, they'll run and hide into their burrows, and they'll make the sound of rattlesnakes to their predators. And 
their burrows, um, they get them from the same place that snake that rattlesnakes often do, and that's um, stealing them from prairie dogs. So it works pretty good. Uh, feral and outside cats, along with habitat loss, pose the greatest threat to the survival of burrowing owls in some areas. Next up is the red-tailed hawk. Its origin is native. Feeding habit is carnivore. Relationship with humans is wild. They are federally protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. They can kill and eat prey up to twice their weight. They are very popular in falconry due to their trainability and calm disposition. If you look in the upper right, you'll see that the year-round range encompasses pretty much all of North America minus Canada and Alaska. Um, and they're up there during the summer breeding months also. And last up for birds is the chucker. Origin is introduced. Feeding habit is omnivore. Relationship with humans is wild. They were brought over from Southwest Asia as a game species. Uh, Southwest Asia in the Middle East, I should say. Um, you can see their distribution, though. It's pretty much just the West. Um, they're related most closely to rock partridge, and they are actually the national bird of Iraq. Next group of animals we'll talk about is the amphibians, which would be one half of the herps I spoke about earlier. Some things that make them interesting is that they must lay eggs in moist or wet environments. They don't have a thick, leathery coating over their eggs like the next group does. Um, they were the first terrestrial anim animals to evolve from fish. They have usually smooth skin. Their, that skin contains mucus and or poison glands. Uh, they are the only vertebrate to undergo complete metamorphosis, and very few uh, are herbivores. The one animal we have to represent amphibians is the Columbia spotted frog. Its origin is native, feeding habit is omnivore, and relationship with humans is wild. It's pretty unusual, actually, to find a frog that's an omnivore, but the Columbia spotted frog has been known to eat vegetation along. Uh, the shoreline of ponds and lakes that it inhabits. Um, it was listed as a candidate for the endangered species for 22 years before it was removed in 2015 due to collaborative efforts made by landowners and conservationists. Um, fish stocked high mountain lakes threaten some populations still though, so I wouldn't be surprised if they popped up on consideration for the list uh, in the decades to come, but we shall see. Keep our fingers crossed. Next group of animals up is the reptiles. Um, some things that make that group interesting are they are very poor with hearing and they rely on vibration, which they sense through their their um, their head. They'll lay it actually on the ground, and that's how they best sense the vibration, um, kind of like how we sense sound. Uh, they have dry scales, unlike amphibians, and that allow them to stray further from water due to the fact that it holds in moisture. Uh, many do not ever need to drink water, as they get most their, or they get all of their uh, water from uh, the uh, animals they consume. Um, the eggs can be laid on dry land, duvet leather, leathery covering I talked about earlier. And um, one interesting note, if you're ever trying to figure out if it's a, a lizard or a snake or a legless lizard, is that uh, lizards actually have eyelids and snakes do not. Um, First animal up representing reptiles is horned lizards, and their origin is native, feeding habit is carnivore, and relationship with humans is wild. I actually don't have a distribution map up for this animal because it was hard to find one for um, all of the different species that represent this group, uh, but you can pretty much just think of it as uh, everything uh, west of the Mississippi, uh, excluding some very north northern uh, Midwestern states, um, but pretty much the entire West. Uh, many genera that have a wide range covering everything west of the Mississippi River, like I just said, uh, mainly eats ants. Um, and some species are even capable of squirting aimed streams of blood from their eyes that have uh, chemical deterrents in it as well that scientists currently think um, is actually derived from uh, the ants that they eat. 
Next reptile up is the western rattlesnake. Um, its origin is native, feeding habit is carnivore, and relationship with humans is wild. Uh, the distribution map I have right there is for all the different um, snakes that make up western rattlesnakes. Uh, the picture below on the left is the um, northwest Pacific rattlesnake, and that's in the uh, northern part of its range over there uh, in Washington and uh, Idaho. They seem to be more calm and less likely to strike than some of its relatives, like the Western Diamondback. Uh, I've stepped over these many a time, and they don't even really uh, care. Uh, it's pretty hard to get them to even shake their rattle at you. You almost have to poke them with a stick, although I don't recommend it. Uh, they're still venomous, so don't step on them. Um, females give a live birth to as many as 25 young. Uh, next group of animals up is the fish. Some things that make them unique are swim bladders, uh, gills, lateral lines, which are uh, sensing organs that are on the outside of their body that uh, allow them to uh, sense electrical signals and impulse pulses. Um, it's pretty interesting. And a lot of fish will actually have a line marking, uh, a coloration marking along the side of their bodies, and that's, that's where that lateral line is at. They were the first organism to have a bony skeleton. Um, they have no external ears and no eyelids. The one fish we have to represent that group is the bull trout. Its origin is native, feeding habit is carnivore, and relationship with humans is wild. Uh, they are federally protected in some areas in its range under the Endangered Species Act. They are anadromous, which means they live uh, their lives in the beginning in freshwater streams, and uh, as they get older and they get uh, stronger. They work their way out into the open ocean where they spend the majority of their lives uh, only returning to spawn and die at the very end. Uh, an interesting uh, thing about this is that uh, they actually bring nutrients from out in the open ocean such as nitrogen and when they come back and, and they die their bodies deposit this these extra nutrients um, either rotting away at the, the banks of the um, and shores or uh, bears that come by and eat them or other sorts of carnivores or omnivores come by and eat those bodies and then those nutrients are actually deposited in the forests around those rivers um, essentially bringing in nutrients from from the open ocean and depositing them into these forests so it's actually pretty interesting scientists have uh, traced uh, minerals in these trees to minerals that came from the open ocean so it's a pretty interesting note i think the last group of animals we're going to cover is insects. Um, I know that sounds kind of strange. People don't think of insects as being animals, but they, they truly are. Uh, some things that make them interesting are they all have an exoskeleton. They lay eggs. They have three separate body parts, the thorax, abdomen, and head. They have six legs, um, two pairs of wings, although a lot of times um, uh, they have gone away or some different... Um, some of their examples will have wings, while uh, others, uh, such as ants, some of them will have wings, some of them won't. Uh, but if they do have wings, they're in uh, two pairs. Some of those wings have been modified to be coverings for an inner set of wings, such as beetles. But as a general rule, if they have wings, they have two pairs. Uh, they actually outnumber humans 1,000 to 1. And that's why it's important that we're going to talk about them, is because uh, the impact they have on rangelands is is quite large. Uh, the first insect we're going to talk about is the mason bee. Um, I was originally going to pick, the, pick a honeybee, but I, I kind of wanted to have a, a native, and honeybees were actually brought over from Europe, and they can be thought of as uh, cattle of the insect world. Um, so, and uh, honeybees are one of only two insects that were introduced and domesticated. The other is a uh, um, the silkworm, interestingly enough. Um, so the mason bee's origin is native. The feeding habit is an herbivore, since they derive all of the energy from plants. Our relationship with humans is wild. Um, so mason bees do provide a huge economic benefit um, through uh, pollination of all kinds of fruit, nut, and all kinds of uh, other kinds of orchards out there. Next up is the grasshopper. Origin is native, feeding habits herbivore, relationship with humans is wild. Um, 
just like the Mason B before, their distribution is across the entire U.S. Um, pretty much anywhere you see plants, you'll find these two organisms to some degree. Although grasshoppers are far more common than Mason bees. Um, grasshoppers are uh, prolific across the U.S. and the, the globe as a whole, pretty much excluded from areas that are uh, barren or uh, too cold. Uh, when they swarm, uh, a lot of different species of grasshopper will change into what's called a locust, and they actually uh, will start changing in color and behavior, and they will become more voracious with appetite, and uh, they can devastate entire crops and send places into famine. Um, they are also one of the oldest forms of chewing insect alive, so it just shows you how how good they are set up for what they do. Last up is the harvester ant. Its origin is native. Feeding habit herbivore and relationship with humans is wild. These are the ants you usually see in ant farms. Uh, this group of ants is made up of many different species, and they range across the entire U.S., as you can see in the distribution map up there. Um, a lot of the conflict that comes from these is due to their, uh, their large, visible, above-ground mounds that uh, sometimes pop up on agricultural fields. Well, that was a great overview of rangeland animals with a lot of good examples. Thanks to William Gentry for that. And that is all that we have on rangeland animals that we'll talk about more in this class.